And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed. And I will put my law in their minds and write it in their hearts. Shalom. Hello again. Well, here I am attired in the costume of the high priest of the tabernacle of Israel, the tabernacle in the temples, uh, because tonight we're going to look at the new covenant. Both covenants, the old covenant, the law, and the new covenant, uh, which under which we still live, uh, were administered by high priests. The old covenant, the priest of the temple and tabernacle who wore this costume, and the new covenant by Jesus, our high priest, in the, uh, after the order of Melchizedek, as it says in the book of Hebrews. Last week we took up the Davidic covenant, the last one made with uh, Israel as a nation. Well, this one actually is made with Israel too, but then all who believe in the Jewish Messiah, other nations come into it, and so uh, the new covenant is for the whole world. Uh, the two of them are rather parallel. Uh, Romans 8, 3, and 4 point out the uh, similarity of these two. You can hear bells ringing when I, when I move in this costume because it's got bells and pomegranates sewn at the bottom of the robe. And uh, that is, of course, I explained in a previous program, so that the priests moving around in the Holy of Holies could be heard ministering. If the bell stopped ringing, it was time to fish him out of there. He may have died. He was aged. They tied a rope around his leg just in that case, so the, the story goes. And when the bell stopped ringing, they had to pull on that rope. Anyway, Romans 8, 3 and 4 says this, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, that is, people couldn't really obey the law very well, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And I could compare uh, Scripture about the old law with uh, Scripture about us, and it comes out very parallel. That is, us as the, the church, the believers in our new high priest. The old law, Exodus 19, 6, said this, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. Uh, that's if we'll obey God's law. Now, in the New Testament, 1 Peter 2.9 says about the church, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation. Uh, precisely the same thing. If we'll obey the new covenant, we will be as holy and as righteous with God as those who would have w completely obeyed the old covenant. Now, the, uh, the Old Covenant was a matter of performance, laws, do's and don'ts. Uh, the New Covenant, well, Messiah said instead of do or don't, he said, it is done. <laughs> Tetelestai, a Greek term, which uh, uh, means it is finished. It was an official legal term. When you had served your sentence and uh, were, were uh, completely uh, uh, finished with it. If you, if you were given 10 years or something, you served all 10 years, uh, they gave you, in effect, a stamp. They wrote across your original order to be imprisoned the Greek word tetelestai, and that means it is finished, done, paid in full is a good translation. That is what the Lord cried out from the cross, paid in full tetelestai in the Greek, and it meant that the penalty he paid was the penalty for all of our sins, past, present, and future, all of us who will believe in that sacrifice. That is the gospel in its essence. The good news is sin is forgiven. He forgave it. At the time of, of, of his sacrifice, the veil in the temple was torn top to bottom. This veil was was uh, four inches thick. It would have taken a team of horses to tear it. It was impossible to repair. 
Uh, in other words, access was open to God. The old, uh, the old way was the veil covered up the area where the priests and God did the real ministry. The congregation stood outside the veil. But once the Lord was sacrificed, it was torn. And every man had free access to God. As the prophet Joel says, uh, your handmaids and servants will prophesy, your young men will dream dreams, and so on. Uh, the ordinary folks, and, and whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So uh, Peter quoted it at Pentecost to a crowd of very ordinary worshipers when the Holy Spirit came. Now, what does the uh, New Covenant say? In fact, it was announced by the prophet uh, Jeremiah, who... Uh, uh, actually prophesied its inception. It's not originally mentioned in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament, Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It is originally made with the Jewish people, as are all of the covenants from Abrahamic on. Uh, others come into it, of course. Others come into the Abrahamic covenant when they believe. But uh, it is made with Israel. He says, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. This covenant is going to be uh, different than the law. And, and God mentions here the problem with the former covenant. He says, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. The problem was everybody broke the old covenant. And if you read it, it's a tough covenant. There are very hard laws. And uh, well, I could mention the law for the Day of Atonement, 24 hours of confession on a day that you fast. Uh, and you're supposed to mention the sins of an entire year and technically not supposed to miss a single one, this sort of thing. Very, very high standard, very high uh, perfection level. And the Orthodox today, uh, with their uh, almost strange looking ways, are really trying to keep 613 laws all the time, day and night, uh, which is an onerous burden. And God says they, they kept breaking it. And so he made a new covenant, or Jeremiah prophesies that he will. In verse 33, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. The old law was written in stone. The new law is written on the heart, a very soft place. The old law, the, the priest could convict you by pointing at the law and showing you your, your action, and it wouldn't agree, and, and you were convicted. But the new law, so-called law, uh, it's, it's written on the heart so that no one convicts you of not walking correctly with Messiah. They, they're not supposed to judge you, but your conscience hurts, your heart hurts when you have disobeyed the law of Christ, and, and, and you know it does. Actually, the New Testament contains no laws. There are no passages, as there are throughout the Old, that say uh, uh, this, uh, 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 you must obey, or uh, you will die, or, or, or lest ye die, or be cut off from the children of Israel or the land of Israel. There's no law plus penalty given anywhere in the New Testament. There's no laws in that sense. But there is this writing on the heart, which all of us have and all of us can feel. And he says, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. That's the essence of the new covenant. He'll forgive all sin. He won't remember it anymore. Uh, a great Bible teacher said to me once, <laughs> you would know him if I mentioned his name, but he, he confided in me, you know, I quit saying to God, I won't do that anymore because I know that God would say, do what anymore? I don't remember. And that is what he promised. That's his part of this covenant. His part of the bargain is he just won't remember our sins. It's as though, uh, you know, I, I've said it before, but we have a kind of a gift certificate to salvation. Uh, when you have a gift certificate, you take it to the store and they give you the merchandise. They don't charge you. Uh, it's it's not that the merchandise is is uh, free, but it's that someone came there ahead of you and paid for it. 
Jesus came ahead of us and paid for all of our sins, so God doesn't have to remember them. No more than you have to remember a phone bill you paid last month does God remember sins that are paid up, and so they're gone. And that is the new covenant in its essence. And he says, every man will know me, saying, know the Lord. Well, that's in the kingdom. This is finally fulfilled in its uh, ultimate when the kingdom comes and the Lord reigns in Jerusalem. And of course, the whole world knows him. Perhaps they'll, they'll see him on television every night. I don't know. They'll surely go up from year to year to worship the Lord and celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, it says in Zechariah 14, 16. So they will know him in that way. At least annually, everybody will have uh, uh, beheld the king himself. So they will all know him. Nobody will have to go around saying, know the Lord like we do now. Uh, the, the, you might call an unbeliever's attention, and there are some in the kingdom, to the Lord in Jerusalem, but you won't have to say, let me tell you about him. They know about him. And the covenant goes on with the Lord's signature. Thus saith the Lord which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. That's God's signature, <laughs> the one who, who gives the sun and the moon and divides the sea and, and sets the tides. That has to be God. And he dates the covenant. This is just like any contract we would make. It's got a signature. It's got a date. The next verse, if those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Well, the nation of Israel is there. It's in good shape. The Roman Empire is gone. The Babylonians, the Persians, the Greek Empire, <laughs> the ancient Egyptians, all gone. But Israel is there. And this covenant is dated as that if Israel is a nation, then it's still in force. It would have to cease from being a nation for it to be abrogated or canceled. And finally, he says in... A, in uh, if you would question Israel's security, he says, Thus saith the Lord, if heaven above can be measured, and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. He says, uh, the day that I cast off Israel is the day you tell me how I made the universe, how I hung the planets, how, how I laid the foundation. Like the, the discussion he had with Job when he said, where wast thou when I laid the cornerstone of the earth? And, and that established who Job was and who God was. So uh, Israel is secure and solid in God's eyes. As long as it's there, this covenant is in force. As long as this covenant is in force, our sins are forgiven. That is what Messiah did for us. Back with you after this. And I will put my law in their minds and write it in their hearts. The soul of the Holy Land. Come with Zola on his next tour to Israel. This is worship at the wall, the Western Wall, or so-called Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. The Orthodox Jews come here to pray for the coming of Messiah. In our study of the New Covenant, I talked to some Israelis about the Messiah's kingdom. Benjamin Berger is the pastor of a Messianic synagogue. These are things that are written, these are things that are written in the New Covenant, and these are things that are fulfilled in the New Covenant. And of course, the whole Messianic reign is connected to the New Covenant, because the New Covenant has to do with the covenant of an inner uh, transformation. And uh, that is the only way that peace is really going to come upon the earth, is when we're changed from within. Uh, peace cannot come just by something outer. It there has to be an inner change. I mean, men are struggling to create peace on this earth politically. Yes. But of course, we know that it can never really succeed, because unless the hearts of men are changed, how can we expect for real peace to come upon the earth? 
Uh, do you believe that the new covenant uh, is yet to come when the Lord comes, or are we already living in it? Well, I believe that we are already partaking of the new covenant, all of us who believe. But I believe that when the kingdom comes, it's going to become something universal. Right now, it's, it's limited. It is universal, and yet it's limited. Because you, we can't say that the, the, the kingdom of the Messiah has been manifested on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're living in a situation where there's wars, there's hatred, there's killing, there's all the things that have always been. But in the messianic reign, those things will cease. And so men will have to have been changed in order for those things uh, to, to cease. And it will be something universal. Because it says at the end of Zechariah, in that name, in that day, the name of the Lord will be one and he will rule over all the earth. Well, I can almost hear our audience wondering, when does he think this will happen? Well, I don't want to speculate. <laughs> I don't want to speculate. In this time of, uh, of failing peace processes here in Israel, I mean, you live in beautiful Ein Karim next to troubled Jerusalem. I mean, it's, when do you think it'll happen? Well, I think we're, we're getting closer to that time. I mean, I think there are a lot of signs in the world that, uh, that we're getting closer to the time when the Messiah will return. Uh, I think the world, my personal view is that the world can't continue much longer the way it's going. I mean, the potential for destruction in the world is enormous. And we can, you know, and there can always be some kind of a, a crazy individual like Saddam Hussein that uh, can, do, uh, can, can do things that could uh, totally wreck the earth. I mean, th that possibility is there today. And I think there are many, many other areas that indicate to us that we're living in a very, very, very dangerous time. And, uh, and of course, the establishment of Israel as a nation in the land, I believe, is another sign, though I actually believe Israel is going to go through some very, very uh, difficult times before uh, the second coming of the Messiah. But I do think we are in that period. How many years it will take, I have no idea. I do not know. But I think, you know, Jesus said, this generation will not pass away until all these things are fulfilled. And he was talking about the generation of when the fig tree began to give her leaves. So I think the time is near, mm -hmm. but I personally cannot say when exactly that time will be. Rabbi Henry Noach is an Orthodox Jew who also believes that the nation of Israel plays a vital role in the Messianic age. And I'm referring to Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 to 4. It shall come to pass in the latter days, and then a few words later, for out of Zion shall go forth Torah, instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And then a little later, nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn, learn war anymore. In other words, the culmination of the story of Israel and its gathering is the end of all wars amongst nations. So the dilemma with which Adam and Eve, or through Cain and Abel, were faced at the outset of history is now resolved. But it is resolved through the uh, unfolding of the history of the Jewish people in this land, because only a nation can be a light unto the nations. And therefore, the Jews had to become a nation once again by returning to their homeland to fulfill their messianic redemptive uh, uh, role in history. To witness the crowded marketplace and streets of Jerusalem is to witness a miraculous regathering of Jews from 108 nations around the world. Gary Cooperberg, a resident of Hebron, believes that Israel is experiencing a spiritual awakening. Are we moving in a direction of a great forgiveness by God and a messianic age? And it has to be that way. There, can be, and there cannot be another explanation. Otherwise, we're lost. It's completely finished and there's nothing else to talk about. There has to be a return to God, a return to, to, to obedience to His law, and a cleansing. And this time of year before Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the Day of Judgment, the Jewish people look inward and try to perfect themselves and do tshuva. And the word tshuva means return. Return to God, return to observance. It's as if we have strayed off the path and we just have to come back to it. We're not damned uh, and, and, and totally uh, banned from, from everything if we stray from the path. There's always the option for the Jew to return, to come back to the right path. And God is there waiting for us to help us come back. Our rabbis tell us if we make a hold the size of the head of a pin, 
The God of Israel will push the whole world through that hole for us. All we have to do is try a little bit, and he'll help us the rest of the way. And uh, I, I've seen that in my own life. Yeah. I really believe that. But do you see signs of a national awakening, a spiritual awakening in Israel? If you go to the people, you see it. You yeah. see it in the streets. You see it in the people. The only thing that's missing in Israel is a, a genuine Jewish leader. That's all. The people will follow immediately in massive numbers. Even the left wing and the non-believers, they will follow too. So when they uh, see genuine faith, they will recognize it immediately. If a genuine Jewish leader showed up on the Mount of Olives, say, <laughs> <laughs> that would help. <laughs> uh, of course. Yeah. Gary, you're, you're so knowledgeable in these things. I really... Uh, I don't think it's knowledgeable so much. I really believe all of these things. It's, it's, a, it's a matter of faith. I think faith supersedes knowledge sometimes. It's, it's, a, it's a much more powerful uh, uh, entity. It, it's hard to ex explain it, but living in the city of Abraham, where the first example of faith were, uh, made his home and where he rests in Hebron. <laughs> today in Hebron, it gives a, an added strength. And when you look around you, you have to go beyond the television screens and beyond the, the, the political uh, crises that we see from day to day and recognize that we are living part of a divine process and nothing can stop it. Nothing can prevent it from, from going to completion. And it's a privilege and, and a blessing to be able to be alive at a time like this and certainly in a place like that. Recently, at a prophecy conference here in Dallas, the distinguished theologian, Dr. John Welver, spoke about the signs of the times and the last days. We'll come back with Christ and reign with him for a thousand years on earth. I spoke to him about his views of the new covenant and Israel's place in the coming kingdom. The new covenant uh, announced in Jeremiah and repeated in uh, Hebrews, I make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Is, uh, is that a prediction of Christianity? Well, there's a lot of dispute among theologians on that, and I have a, my own personal view. In theology, we have what we call the covenant of grace, that Christ in eternity past uh, agreed to be the Savior, and died on the cross. Now, of course, there never was a time when that wasn't true, but humanly speaking, we think of it as happening, and he uh, offered grace to those that put their faith in him. And, of course, that's the basic for salvation. That's the basis for all blessing. It's the basis for all forgiveness. Now, uh, because there is this grace available, made possible by the death of Christ, Israel is going to get the millennial kingdom. And Jeremiah 31 is talking about the millennial kingdom and Israel's restoration. Now, this isn't something they deserved. This is something that came out of the grace of God. Now, in the New Testament, we have the Lord's Supper, uh, which deals with the fact that Christ died for those who are members of the church or the body of Christ. And that's also called a new covenant. It's all new because it all stems from the grace of God. And we have the covenant with Israel. We have the covenant with the church. And then, of course, salvation from Adam on was all based on the death of Christ. So everybody was saved, was saved by grace. They weren't saved any other way. And so it extends to salvation for anyone who was saved in past, present, or future. So do we presently live under this new covenant? We are. Christians are. So God remembers our sin no more, forgives right. our iniquities. We're justified by faith, declared righteous by God, because he sees us in the perfections of the person and work of his Son. It's not enough to have read the, the Bible or to go to a certain church of a certain denomination, uh, but one must receive Christ, subscribe That's to illustrated, this. of course, in Nicodemus in John 3. He was a godly Jew. He went to the synagogue every Sabbath day. I'm sure he tithed. I'm sure he brought his offerings. He was trying to keep the law the best he could. And Christ said, Nicodemus, you can't enter the kingdom of God or see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. And of course, he had trouble with that. But I believe he did trust in Christ. And he was one of those who prepared Christ's body for burial, you remember. Yes. And he was a Christian at that time. So he did come to a new birth in Christ. But the whole point is that religion is not enough. No matter how good your works are, you never get saved by works.
I wanted to mention that the New Covenant, of, of course, repeated in the New Testament for New Covenant believers, and that is in Hebrews 8, uh, starting in verse 7, it says, For if that first covenant had been faultless, uh, then there should be no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And he goes on, that's Hebrews 8, 8 to 12. He repeats the very words of Jeremiah about this covenant made in the New Testament with Israel and with Judah. If you have people say that God was finished with the Jews, well, that's funny. In this book written to the Hebrews, he pronounces that new covenant to them and he makes the covenant with them. If you are a Gentile, you are saved under a covenant made with Israel and with Judah, and that is how God made his covenants. Um, on our chart, we can see where it occurred in Israel's history. Uh, we covered the early covenants, Edenic, Adamic, and Noahic at the beginning, and then the important Abrahamic covenant, and uh, the covenant about the land, and about King David. The Mosaic Covenant is down here on a line with the New Covenant. This is the law and this is the New Covenant. And the New Covenant uh, is announced here really by Jeremiah in the Old Testament, goes through the cross and on into the kingdom when it's uh, truly fulfilled. So that is its timeline. And uh, it's compared to the Mosaic as new and the other old, like we say Old Testament and New Testament. But anyway, uh, next week we'll review all the covenants. And by the way, Gerald Schroeder, professor, will be back with us in this review. And you can look again at his theory uh, of the six days of creation. We received more mail about this than anything else we ever had on our program. And uh, all of our music will be in the next program. Often in the last program, we review all the music. So be sure to tune in. Our offers tonight, once through the New Testament, uh, my synopsis of the New Testament written with Dr. McCall, and Discovering Our Jewish Roots, our tape series, which caused quite a controversy in Lexington, Kentucky, where it was originally created. Uh, you'll want to know about that. Get this tape series. It's very, very good. And Discover Your Jewish Roots. Get them at our post office box. And and Sha'alu, Shalom Yerushalayim, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. <laughs>